Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I am a recursor back from summer 2012 when yeah, it was still hacker school and was here at Etsy. So it was the first batch at Etsy. And since then, a lot of time has passed and I moved to the US and we, we moved to this new office over here. Um, so you all know Etsy is a global marketplace for handmade and vintage goods with 1.6 million active sellers. And let's talk about how the API first approach transformed the architecture at Etsy. Um, so uh, the website runs on PHP. It has a model view controller architecture. A controller receives a request and fetches the required data from the database. And via the object relational mapper, it returns model instances and renders them in a view, returning the HTML to the client. So that's basically how Etsy works. Um, very simple, right? Um, <laughs> So over time, this architecture showed some problems. Uh, the first problem was that people with more and more different devices wanted to use Etsy. Uh, that's not a problem, actually, right? <laughs> but we had no cross-device abstraction in our architecture. So this leads to duplicated logic, and it's really hard to keep it consistent. So what started out as like the left side of the diagram over time became something like this, like the whole thing, um, a lot of repeated logic. And the second problem that we had was performance in terms of speed or time to glass. So the time until you see something on the screen of your device. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna start <laughs> with a quote here from ASM who works at Etsy and he said, we desperately need to figure out a scheme for allowing concurrency or else we're gonna go have performance problems forever. <laughs> I really like this quote. <laughs> so that's where we were at at that time. Um, so PHP has no concurrency, and the page grew in terms of users and features, uh, while mobile networks are the bottleneck for network speed, right? Everything became slower. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, a third problem was that the design of the API was tied to the database schema and allowed the user to make really complex requests. Doesn't also sound like a problem, but people could, for example, request a list of shops and then all the listings for each of them at once. So they could generate quite a strain on our back end. And it was hard to assess the performance of our cluster with these varying requests that were controlled by the users. So we set out to develop a better version of the API framework, which we call version three. <laughs> um, Version two had some good qualities that we kept. So REST resources uh, work quite well, we keep this. And then um, another good idea that we kept was the declarative approach and the automation of input validation. So not everyone has to do it, the framework does it. And then some new ideas. Um, a new idea was to decouple the endpoints from the framework that hosts them. So we minimize the endpoints responsibilities to declaring the route declaring the input expectations and implementing what happens in the endpoint. Uh, the framework then glues these responsibilities together at runtime and it can even compile the complete set of routes to the endpoints and the client to call them. Uh, for example, from JavaScript. So, and then inspired by Netflix and eBay's QLIO, we added server-side composition of resources into device view specific resources. What does that mean? In other words, uh, we're allowing a second layer of endpoints that are consumers of our own API, requesting and aggregating other endpoints. Um, these requests use our generated PHP client, and we did this with curl, which you might have heard about. So um, the interesting question is how to bring concurrency into the single threaded world of PHP. <laughs> Uh, forking could have been a possibility, but we just had a post-mortem on an incident related to a fork explosion when creating too many fork jobs for a PHP's <laughs> job processing queue. German, that was also a recursor who did that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in an HTTP context, so what about making additional HTTP requests for concurrency? We could do that, right? Um, so sometime in 2013, Paul posted, Curl Mighty InfoRead is my new event loop. <laughs> and at Hack Week, uh, Paul and Matt built a prototype for concurrency in the HTTP layer with Curl Mighty InfoRead. It checks on a Curl Mighty handle in a non blocking way to control the scheduling of parallel calls. So it could look something like this, maybe. <laughs> um, we also have some logic to establish dependencies on requests to other endpoints. 
We are running the request when the corresponding proxy becomes unblocked, similar to an event loop. You probably know this from Node.js. Um, the concurrency dependency analysis and the scheduling uh, conveniently happen all in one place, which we call the curl callback orchestrator. Um, this is great because from the endpoint author's point of view, the code looks sequential and single-threaded. So this looks pretty simple, right? I do shop about, FAQ, seller details, and then I run this curl callback orchestrator there. Um, so it looks sequential and single-threaded, and it's just this list of proxy calls to other endpoints. We're getting closer to a declarative style. And all of a sudden, we have a distributed system. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's look at an example request to the etsy.com homepage with this new API framework. So here's the homepage. Um, the page has several sections of information. They are interesting for me as a potential buyer when I'm looking at it. So there are listings that I favorited, um, then some picks from Etsy's recommendation algorithms and uh, items from my favorite shops, activity from my friends, and so on. Uh, so like these little sections of information. And if we look into this data even more detail, we could see even more structure. It's like a tree growing from left to right. And the structure of our server pools and of the network is mirroring this tree. Each edge in this tree is a HTTP request on a network and each node is an endpoint. Let's have a look at this. Um, let's say we start with an HTTP request from my browser to etsy.com. From there, we're looking at the API layer. That's what we see here. A bespoke API request is being made to get a personalized version of the homepage data from our API server. So that's what's happening first. Um, remember this meta endpoint that I talked about? This is it. <laughs> it's here. Um, a bespoke endpoint aggregates data from other endpoints to, cre to create a response tailored to a specific view distinct by service and perspective. And um, this request may consist of multiple concurrent requests, such as my favorites, for example. Um, they are concurrent component because they consist of a large number of listing cards that can be fetched in parallel. So that's this concurrent layer here. Um, so this other type of meta endpoint that we have in place is a concurrent endpoint. It aggregates data from other endpoints in parallel, but it's not for a specific view. And at the leaves of the tree, there are the atomic component endpoints. And these endpoints don't kick off other HTTP requests, but they can access the database. And this uh, three-tier model is interesting because it allows us to create an intermediate level of component objects. And they are not tied to the database schema. So we create a seam in the system. Both ends can move uh, without things breaking. So this is new. And the project that got Maggie, Maggie, <laughs> Maggie, hello Maggie. Um, <laughs> Maggie and me started uh, diving deep into Etsy's API framework was unifying the syntax of API endpoints. We carved out a domain specific language for uh, building blocks for endpoints. Um, each endpoint, for example, needs to declare its route uh, so we know where it can be found on the web. And also it needs a human readable description and a result type. And all the data we return from the endpoint will be JSON encoded. But here we could say that we return a primitive data type, for example, such as a string inside that encoding. Or we could return what we call a typed resource. That's a compound type from the Etsy application domain. So it could be a listing card, for example, which contains all the information about an item that's listed for sale on Etsy. And then there's the handle function um, in which the endpoint runs the code that it needs to build this response, how con to construct it. Um, and then there are some optional functions. Declare input, it's only necessary if the endpoint actually needs input parameters, some of them don't. Um, and then the included services function allows an endpoint to opt into a specific service that's opt-in. And then there's this cache TTS a seconds function which allows you to specify whether an endpoint should be cached and what should be the time to live for that endpoint. Oops. Mm. Can you see? Okay. Um, so we need two more parts. We're almost done. Um, the framework still needs two more parts. How does an API request get routed to an endpoint and how can we make an API request from our code? And both parts can be compiled from the endpoint declaration files, and that's the job of the API compiler. So the code is being generated using a mustache template 
And that's kind of funny because it's a template language for websites, but it works really well in this context too. Uh, that's what we know best. <laughs> um, so how is this API infrastructure related to Etsy's architecture? Um, we heard that PHP, it's like single-threaded, shared nothing environment, and when that environment is being set up, that's called the bootstrap process at Etsy. Um, and that's yeah, setting up the environment for each request. Creating additional layers of HTTP requests led to a slowdown caused by the bootstrap overhead. And at the same time, the new endpoints could do more work in less wall clock time, which is great again, right? But it's also an invitation for more complex work on the servers, like exactly what Kayer said. <laughs> we had a problem. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the PHP time to request was getting really slow, even though we had concurrency now. And we kept racking more servers until we had four times the servers. And then we ran out of space and power in the data center. So <laughs> it's no long-term solution. <laughs> um, and then we tried several things to speed this up. We tried to skip some work by marking optional requests and saying we're just not doing those. <laughs> and then uh, also we tried to minimize the PHP bootstrap tags by hand optimizing the loading of PHP files. But that was really hard because other people keep like coding against you. <laughs> and then uh, a really big step forward was the introduction of caching. Uh, we set it on Varnish. Uh, and not all endpoints can be cached, but for the cached ones, uh, Varnish will serve the same response many times. And we accept some staleness for a 10 to 15 minute period. And that drastically reduced the amount of work required for these requests. So for the cacheable case, case, Varnish handles thousands of requests per second with an 80 percentage rate. So that's big. Uh, but the biggest step forward came from a courageous experiment. Dan Miller, who's sitting right there, um, from the core team, looked at bigger organizations that faced the same problem. And he tried out Facebook's HHVM on our API cluster. And he got a rocket ship. <laughs> um, so with that, we could do the same work, but faster, and it saved us to this day. The performance gain from HHVM was a catalyst for the performance improvements that made it into PHP 7. We're now on PHP 7 everywhere, but it's unclear what we would have done without HHVM back in the day. So it saved us. Um, so if we sit back and think about this infrastructure for a bit, how is this specific to Etsy's ecosystem? Where wouldn't it work? And the most obvious gaping hole, in my opinion, is that we have no versioning. <laughs> that, that's mind-boggling. How do we even get away with that? <laughs> uh, we solve this by keeping our public API small and our internal API very, very fluid. And since we control both ends of the API via client generation and via these meta endpoints, um, the intermediate language of domain objects is free to evolve. It's tied into our continuous deployment system, and it's moving along with our up to 60 deploys per day in Etsy web. And the client is constantly in flux for the internal API. And as long as it's internal at Etsy, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Even the outermost layer of bespoke endpoints is very malleable, uh, but it matures over time. Of course, this is different for the Etsy apps and for the third-party API, but those only branch off after maturing on the internal API service over several months, usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we ourselves are our biggest API consumer and generated clients and existing versioning mechanisms for PHP and JavaScript shield us from the API versioning problem for now. That's kind of cool. And also, they give us cross-platform refactoring between services and languages. So and this is a short story uh, and is a case study of how the API first approach transformed the architecture at Etsy. Um, but the story of architectural decisions is maybe transferable to other systems. So what did we learn from the decisions? Any surprises? Um, we learned that we can grow a system from a hack day project to a live system. And <laughs> over time, this DSL of endpoints evolved, and the system grew according to the developer's needs. Also, we learned a great deal about curl and the according PHP extension. 
Not only does it allow us to make parallel requests, but it also lets us check on, control, and modify the in-flight requests in a non-blocking way. That's pretty awesome. And another realization is to think more about capacity planning and caching. We added caching in a hurry. <laughs> um, a huge positive surprise was the HHVM experiment. By teeing traffic to HHVM and trying out a completely new system, we solved our performance problems to this day, basically. Um, the textbook approach says design APIs contract first. As we have seen, we circumvent that part by using automated client generation. That's an interesting trick. So did that work? How, how did it end? <laughs> did we succeed? I would say, yep. <laughs> we solved this, and we solved a few unexpected things along the way. Um, despite these initial problems with the extra layer, we figured out unconventional solutions by experimenting and organically growing the system towards the developer's needs. And it works at scale. Almost the entirety of Etsy.com is powered by API v3 now. We are at the point where it's very easy to share new web features also with JavaScript and with the Etsy apps. What we're discussing now is how to shift some of the complexity control back towards the client. So think about this. Could we compile an alternative, more knowledgeable PHP client that lifts the composability from the HTTP layer into the API consumer code? In cases we, where we are our own consumer and we create a website of the same tree structure, this could save us some work by letting us reach through the abstraction layer. So I'm curious about what our next API transformation will be. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening to the story of our API framework. I'm happy to take questions or later, like, find me here. <laughs> and yes, good luck, Paul.